I just uh, read in a magazine uh, the most incredible thing that apparently uh, marmalade in large doses, when I say large doses, I mean, you know, small doses, can be fatal because they uh, seize up the uh, cardiac system and uh, give infections. Yeah, well, well, there's a lot of truth in that because uh, too much vitamin C can diminish your uh, sexual potency and, and I read that in the uh, National Star and what I think uh, the professor was uh, making the point of was that um, too much food of any kind can lead to uh, disease. Are you saying that uh, food is dangerous? Well, let's put it this way, not all food is dangerous, but there are certain kinds of food that are dangerous. Sugar, for example, especially combined with salt. If you have a cup of sugar and salt, I mean, you might as well kiss goodbye to tomorrow. Cause, uh, but the point that uh, Dr. Schlesinger says is that if you eat too much carpet or indeed walk on it, you're in trouble because anything you eat is deadly. And the best thing to eat is nothing. And I think you have to reach a slight compromise. Not like have a yogurt, starve for three days and watch television. I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? Peter Cook is widely regarded as the greatest figure in modern British comedy. Writer, performer, proprietor of Private Eye magazine and the Establishment Club, he dominated British comedy for decades on television, radio, theatre, print and film. Few have had a glimpse at Peter Cook's private world because after his untimely death, he was just 57, Peter's grief-stricken wife, Lynn, closed up his Hampstead house, leaving it like a time capsule, full of comedic treasure. This front door has remained firmly locked for two decades. Lynn has resisted all offers to allow the cameras in. Until now. And so it is that we go through the keyhole. Past the wall with Peter's Derek and Clive graffiti on it. Past the E.L. Wistie inspired hat stand. Through the dining room where Peter and Dudley recorded their improvisations or stared blankly at the garden for inspiration. Up the precarious stairs, well, occasionally precarious for Peter to his study and his bookshelves, which reveal a very eclectic mind indeed. And scattered around the study, as they have been since he died, are such gems as home videos, diaries, family snapshots, letters, rehearsal tapes, and much, much more. What follows isn't a biography of Peter Cook, we've all seen plenty of those before. Instead, we're offering a glimpse of Peter's private world and clips from programmes that have not been broadcast since their original transmission. Many of our best and funniest finds were domestic audio recordings made by Peter alone or with Dudley, and as you've already seen, we've animated some of these. There's no stopping the man, he's doing me now. This is The Undiscovered Peter Cook. The first thing that we almost literally stumbled on was this suitcase which contains memories of Peter's childhood and adolescence. And most interesting is this ancient 16mm home movie shot in the 1930s. Peter was born on the 17th of November 1937 into a middle-class civil service family. He never made any secret of his comfortable background, but these never-before-broadcast pictures show that his origins were very much at the upper end of the middle class. I come from an upper middle-class background, and um, I'm not ashamed of it. A better start in life, I had, I had a better start in life. He was brought up in a big house with gardeners, nannies, and social functions that would have impressed even Lord Peter Whimsey. Peter was educated at public school, Bradley College, 
And in this rare interview with his mother, we discover that the schoolboy Peter was a million miles from the man who created Derek and Clive. Mrs. Cook, Mrs. Yes. Peter Cook, uh, as, a, as a little boy, you say you're no, no, not not little boy. Your Peter was interested in snakes and reptiles and yes, that kind very of thing. Much. And you don't know whether he's still interested in them or not. Does that mean you don't see him at all? Yes, of course I do. But I, I think he's still fond of them, but more distantly. We have a picture of him coming up, actually, there. That he looks very innocent there. And he doesn't look like the little lad who has later learned to shock... I mean, he shocks a lot of people, your Pete, and doesn't he? He was rather shy and retiring when he was young. When did all this change and why? I don't know. You didn't drop him, did you? Of course not. Where did he live as a child? And where did you well, live? in Torquay, and we were in West Africa half the time. What, what so. were you doing there? Well, my husband was propping up the Empire. <laughs> the bit that was left before it... Yes. Did, did it fall over when he left? No, not nearly, not quite. No, he was a district officer out there, oh. and we had to be away rather a lot. Yeah. So he was with grannies. Right. Inside the same suitcase are school photos, a school yearbook that reveals Peter the academic having won three scholarships in a single year, even though he later claimed to have done no work at all. I mean, my last year at Radley was incredible because I passed my exams to Cambridge. I was just staying on there because there's nothing better to do. I used to have breakfast in bed um, brought to me, um, shoes polished, study cleaned, everything like that. I mean, and the, you're allowed certain privileges. I used to go to the pictures a lot in Oxford. There's nothing for me to do academically. He then spent a year on the continent, books about Germany and France reflecting the time he spent abroad studying languages in preparation for Cambridge University. We also found this rather dapper monogrammed grooming case, revealing traces of royal cream stuck to letters to and from the BBC, like this one where Peter attempts to get work on BBC television. Dear Mr Tithridge, I wanted to know if it's possible for a spare time scriptwriter to write occasional sketches for television comedy programmes. I enclose a short sketch about shirts, and this time I've carefully avoided writing with any particular comedian in mind. Also in the case is a hit of 1957, a record of Peggy Sue, a song Peter loved so much that some years later he recorded his own version. We found two tapes of this, one with his vocal only. Ba -ba -ba -ba. That's a bit loud. If you, if you knew Peggy Sue, then you'd know why I feel blue about... And the other one with backtrack. Pains takingly restored here together for the first time. If you knew Peggy Sue, then you'd know why I feel blue about Peggy. My Peggy Sue. Well, I love you, girl. Yes, I love you, Peggy Sue. Frankly, we wondered why we bothered. Oh, oh, oh I'm out of breath. Gosh. <clears throat> Peter, and particularly Dudley, railed against the BBC for having lost most of the episodes of Not Only But Also. There's a whole lot of people who haven't seen those programmes. You know, I think this is one thing that Peter and I both feel badly about, that uh, I think the BBC erased all of our tapes Thank you and good night. <laughs> Are they really? Yeah, I think the they erased the whole bloody lot. I can't imagine. I mean, some idiot. Maybe one but we tracked down the audio from an obsessive fan who hotwired his TV set, electrocuting himself in the process, and recorded them as they aired in the 1960s. And we also tracked down some silent films from various sources, including old film cans from the Trails Department at ABC TV in Australia. And we joined the bits together. Now, is this the sort of uh, suit one can smoke marijuana in? You're planning to get, uh, planning to get stoned up your mind, are you, sir? Well, Devil told me it was going to be a rave, yes. and uh, I want something. I think that's uh, the best, yeah. uh, I wish you wouldn't do that. Yes. Uh, I think that's rather nice, sir. I like it. Uh, the only thing that strikes me is that it is a trifle effeminate. Effeminate? I wouldn't say it was effeminate. I would say it was effeminate, yes. Yeah. Sir, I wouldn't say it was effeminate. I've just said it is effeminate. Yeah. <laughs> I think it is effeminate. Well, you know, sir, we had uh, Matt Schmeling, the boxer, in here the other day, sir, and uh, he went away with a replica of this very suit, and really? I wouldn't call him effeminate, would you, sir? Matt Schmeling? No, I wouldn't call him effeminate. No, I wouldn't call Matt Schmeling effeminate. I wouldn't call him effeminate, He's no. not effeminate, sir. He's never been near a woman in his life. <laughs> he wouldn't... 
He wouldn't touch one, you know, sir. It very worries me, this effeminate thing, because yes. my wife is extremely effeminate, you know. Yeah. <laughs> a ghastly business. I don't know where she picked it up, but she yeah. sort of goes flim-flamming about the place. Yes. Time. It's most yes. Well, we don't want people having difficulty trying to distinguish between the pair of you, do we, sir? Certainly yes. not. Uh, would you like a bend up the back, sir? If you have one, yes. yes. <laughs> You fancy the thin one? Yeah. Well, she can be yours in a matter of moments, Dad. Yeah. You just play your cards right, the thin one. All you have to do is go up to her, say something ironic to establish your amazing masculinity, you see. Oh, yeah. Go up, she's fairly thin, isn't she? Yeah. Or say something ironic like, hello, fatty. <laughs> Being an ironic comment on the fact she's thin. Yeah. Then say to her in a rough, brutal way, like James Cagney used to do, go up to her and say, how about a bit of passionate love with me? You think that'll work? Well, I should think so, yeah. Just be very masculine, I'll, aggressively so. I'll try, shall I? Go on. <laughs> Hello, fat face. How about what? a bit of passionate love? <laughs> How about a bit of passionate love with me then? What happened, Dad? She sat in my face, please. Well, you're away, aren't you? Am I? Physical contact after such a brief meeting, yeah. <laughs> That's the way to do it, Dad. Now you've got to play it extremely cool. Why don't we go upstairs and ignore them for about ten stops? Play it that, cool, Play right? it cool yeah, is the only way to do it, Dan, do you find in any way that you've been affected adversely by the credit squeeze? I know the businessmen up and down the country have been forced to take drastic slashes. <laughs> we also tracked down parts of this episode featuring Peter Sellers, not seen since 1965, and was considered lost for 40 years until being rediscovered in the USA in the Library of Congress's film stores and then returned to the BBC. It's never been rebroadcast on television. Good evening. Here in the studio tonight, we have Mr. Danny Goff, the boxer who has turned portrait painter, and he's having his first show in London at Truth and Reason this week. Mr. Goff. Mr. Goff. Mr. Goff. Hi. Could I oh. tear you away for a moment from your... Do you like to sit down for a while? <laughs> Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Goff, I'm particularly interested to know what led you to leave the ring and enter the highly competitive world of portrait painting. Well, it was about two years ago. I was a uh, frightening killer cane. And I'm uh, afraid I wasn't altogether in trim, you see. I, I had a few pints of bin rose before the night, uh, didn't I? And uh, he got in with a left in the third round, right on the button, he got me. So I went down, as I was uh, sort of lying there, wasn't I? He was lying there, <laughs> yes. I was lying there and I saw this, uh, this thin trickle of blood coming out my left nostril onto the canvas. And suddenly I become aware of what I had in me. Uh, <laughs> blood, that is. No, I mean, uh, no, no. No, not, not that. No, it, it opened up a window on my mind. My vistas was enlarged. I didn't, I didn't know that. Yes, very painful, too. <laughs> and I saw a whole new world of creativity in front of me. And I've been on the canvas ever since. And I see. Uh, Mr. Goff, this is your first show here in London, but I think I'm right in saying that you have had an exhibition in the provinces before this, oh, haven't yeah, you? Yeah. You've had an exhibition in the provinces? Yeah, I have, yeah. I suppose you could say, you see, that this show is uh, in the nature of a sort of comeback for me. I see. You don't agree, then, with critics of this kind of work who say that your kind of painting can damage the brain. <laughs> Definitely don't say that. You wouldn't no. agree with that. I notice you're wearing these rather thick pebble glasses. Isn't it in any way connected with your painting? Well, that's because I've got my opericks of the eyes. <laughs> I've got uh, my opericks in the eyes here, and they also help to uh, 
they also help you see <laughs> to uh, stop the paint coming in the eye. Of course, I believe a lot of painters have in fact suffer, suffered from this uh, similar disease, Whoa. have they not? Tintoretto, wasn't it? Yeah. I believe Tintoretto was astigmatic. Oh. Well. well, we're going to look very shortly at one of Mr. Goff's latest paintings. By the way, um, who is this uh, person here you're painting? What are you talking about? Who is it? Who the is Archbishop this Bishop of Canterbury. <laughs> Who is it? It's the Archbishop it's of the Canterbury. the Archbishop of Canterbury, is it? Yes. Of course it's the Archbishop of Canterbury. Yes, of course it is. <laughs> Seriously, uh, and this late night lineup from June 1967, where Peter discovered that the then controller of BBC Two, David Attenborough, was in the audience, and Peter acted accordingly. They must be out of their mind. Yeah. But I think we must proffer a heartfelt congratulation to Mr. David Attenborough here. Bless his heart. Bless his heart. Bless his heart. Who moved on? from the heady world of making wonderful documentary films about the mating habits of Armand and Michaela Dennis. <laughs> and uh, moving over here, we see um, David Attenborough. Now, David, I, I feel kind of bashful uh, being confronted by a person who is surrounded by um, red tablecloths like you are. But one thing I'd like to ask you, uh, because I'm on a sort of percentage, is why you smoke silk-cut Benson and Hedges cigarettes? <laughs> They're the only ones I could steal. They're the only ones he could steal, and that's a fact, ladies and gentlemen, and you can't deny it. We always hoped to find some forgotten fragments of Peter's comedy during our visit to the house, but what we unearthed exceeded all expectations. Once we'd reassembled the tapes in these boxes, dated New York, 1964, and had painstakingly stuck the edited pieces back together again, we realized that we'd struck gold. This is an entire unknown album by Peter and Dudley, the Dead Sea Tapes, recorded in New York in late 1963 and edited for release early in 1964, but long thought to be lost. The recordings were mentioned in the American press, but Peter and Dudley were worried that they might be prosecuted for blasphemy, which was a serious criminal offence in those pre-Life of Brian days. So they decided not to release the tapes. Peter Cook later recalled them in this never-before-aired interview. We once, in 1963, when we were in New, New York with Beyond the Fringe, we went into Capitol Studios, and on the very same basis as the Derek and Clive records, we did an ad-lib session, which I suppose about five hours of it, which I call the Dead Sea Tapes. The Dead Sea Scrolls have just been discovered, and they're ad-lib things by people who knew Jesus. As doctors, we think... Yes, yes. We think the whole thing was... Yes. <coughs> excuse me. Was, uh, <coughs> was a little unfair on, yes, the, yes. on the general practitioner. Yes, I mean, yes, it, yes. Uh, to say the least, it was a little unorthodox. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Uh, <coughs> Last, I'm sorry. Uh, we were made to look absolute idiots. I mean, uh, it's all very well, these gratuitous miracles, but um, it's yeah, all very yeah. well for the people who were cured, you yeah, see, yeah, but yeah. Uh, it left the doctors with a considerable amount of scrambled eggs on their faces. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You see, I went round, for instance, to see uh, Lazarus's mother, yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah. I explained to her, I, I said, your son, madam, is absolutely incurable. Yes, and yes, the next yes. moment, this fellow was round. Cured the boy in a flash yes, yes, and left yes. me looking absolutely ridiculous. Yes, I mean, yes. I couldn't get another call for, for weeks, you see. Yes, yes, and yes. very soon after that, I went down with an attack of the creeping hab jabs yes, uh, through yes. getting <coughs> nothing to eat. And uh, I tried to get hold of this fellow and uh, uh, see if he could work one of his blasted miracles on me. And uh, you, you know what he said to me? He said, uh, a physician, heal thyself. Yes, 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 yes. I do wish you wouldn't keep on saying yes, 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 yes. I'm sorry, it's a incurable disease I have. Oh, I see, I'm sorry. Yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> 
For an agnostic and skeptic, if not downright atheist, Peter's bookshelves are surprisingly peppered with volumes on spirituality and religion, a subject which perplexed him throughout his life. Religion is at the very core of his most successful film, Bedazzled, in which he plays an incarnation of the devil. What a dreary thing to do. I hope you're proud of yourself. It was pride that got me into this. I used to be an angel, you know, up in heaven. Oh, yeah, you used to be God's favourite, didn't you? That's right. I love Lucifer, it was in those days. With me in the studio is the devil himself, alias Peter Cook. Evening, fans. What sort of re religious views, really, do you have, if any? Well, I have very muddled religious views. I was brought up in Church of England. I went to a school where I went to a daily service in the surplus. And so I was sort of fairly inundated with religion early on. And I'm very confused about it all. Um, how is it that um, on every count in the 20th century the devil is winning hands down? Is this just the weakness of the human race? And why are we created so ill-equipped to deal with the situation we're thrust into without being asked? And if there is a God, which um, I believe in or will believe in, he's a forgiving and understanding God, and um, I should be able to get away with what I do in this, this world. <laughs> Bedazzled is an hilarious retelling of the Faust myth, with the devilish Peter trying to tempt Dudley into selling his soul. Pathetic. While simultaneously playing pathetic and malicious pranks on humanity. <laughs> yeah, that's terrible. But, I mean, apart from the way he moves, what's God really like? I mean, what colour is he? He's all colours of the rainbow, many-hued. But he is English, isn't he? Oh, yes, very upper class. Of course, his son had a lot of problems having such a famous father. Yeah, I always feel sorry for Jesus having his birthday on Christmas Day. You know, just one lot of presents. This interview, recorded on the set of Bedazzled, was only ever broadcast once half a century ago, and only in the London area, so chances are you've never seen it before. For the filmmaker, heaven comes in all sorts of different shapes and sizes. For producer-director Stanley Donan, who is currently making his latest comedy, Bedazzled, in various parts of London, this is his idea of heaven. The gardens of Zion Park in Middlesex. As I said, these are the gardens, and somewhere back there, for the purposes of the story, is God. Well, now, today I've come to Stanley Donan's heaven to meet what must surely be the most unlikely visitor ever to come here, and that is the devil himself. Peter Cook, we've seen you playing the devil many times before on television and the cinema, but this surely is the first time you've ever played the devil, isn't it? Yes, I've been longing for the opportunity, actually. My wife has always said that I am the devil. She thinks I'm an emissary of the devil. At last, I've got the opportunity to play myself. Very nice, too. What's the devil doing in heaven? Well, he always was in heaven. Lucifer was God's favourite angel in the old days, sat around adoring God, but after a while got fed up with it and wanted to be like God and was cast out, I thought rather harshly, for the sin of pride, which we all have to a great extent, certainly I do. And now, after thousands and thousands of years of tempting, doing his job, making the world miserable, he's fed up with it and he wants to go back to heaven again and, you know, sit in the garden, have a nice time and praise the Lord again. Yes. Who specifically do you tempt in this film? Oh, in this film, I, my main tempting activities are centred around Dudley Moore, who is not a difficult figure to tempt, as you can well imagine. Having already succumbed to every temptation in the history of mankind, he's, uh, He's uh, well at home doing this. This sounds to me very much like the Faust theme. I'd have thought that by now we'd have had every conceivable variation on that particular theme. It's your 20th century Faust we're doing. I, well, I don't know. I think it's a fascinating theme. That's why it's been done so often. Um, I've never seen it done really funnily. They're also rather serious things mm. about scholars, you know, wishing to find the secret of life and so on. This is a, a very much a comedy version. I don't think we've had a Faust theme with Raquel Welsh in it before, playing Lust. I don't think we've um, had a Faust theme with a cast of a thousand nuns. And in many ways, I think it's very different from any other. Yes. I certainly hope so. I'd like to ask you about this, because in many of your TV sketches, Heaven and, in fact, nuns seem to feature pretty prominently. What is it about these two things that, you know, to you, make them good comedy material? Well, I'm hoping to get to Heaven and find out as much about it. I think um, religion is for me, one of the most fascinating subjects. I explore it in uh, uh, sort of, I'm not a very religious person, but I'm very interested in it. 
and I don't think it's ever been treated in a really funny way, not a disrespectful way, but just exploring the funny things that happen to people in a religious context, such as this bleeding plane going over yes. now. Yes. Is that sent by the devil, or is it part of God's plan to drown out the interview? Nobody knows. Um, I think this sort of voice would be a good deal. Yes. 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 God bless. But what the bloody hell do we say at this point? Um, improvise yes, improvise and improvise and improvise is what you do. Um, <coughs> hello, this is the Queen of England speaking. I'd like you all to go and see the new film Bedazzled, produced and directed by Stanley Donan, starring Peter Cook, Dudley Moore and Raquel Welsh as Lust. Uh, Pete, that didn't sound very much like the Queen of England, you know. I thought it was a very good imitation. No, very poor. Go and see Bedazzled. There's good subjects. Peter Cook and Dudley Moore can be blamed for everything else. Including this commercial. Oh, whoops. <laughs> yeah, don't blow your nose on the air. But Peter's projects didn't always meet with universal success, as this next tape we discovered in his desk drawer reminds us. In February 1971, Peter briefly hosted a chat show for BBC television entitled Where Do I Sit? It was anarchic and unpredictable, and while some viewers loved it, others hated it, and BBC management soon became very nervous. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the most relaxed show on British television. After three editions, the show was axed, and no tapes were thought to have survived. But we tracked down Peter's audio cassettes of some of the short-lived series. Here is the opening of the second show, with Peter happily reading out some of the no-nonsense abuse he'd received after the first show. Uh, last week we did the first show and uh, we had a record number of inquiries, as you could politely call it, to the duty officer of the BBC, including my own inquiry. Um, I'd like to read a few of them. Uh, I like his programmes, but not him. He is hopeless. <laughs> this is the biggest load of organised crap I've ever seen. <laughs> never mind my name. <laughs> Be in touch, never mind my name, because I never knew the crap was organised. <laughs> well, this is an especially good one. I would love to get at him. <laughs> I would love to get at him. It is so easy to mock and pick on people. We also found this from the first show, Peter's rendition of the Elvis Presley classic. Well, I bless the mop, I saw the what's wrong with me. All shook up. I'll mention luck of my own on the fuzzy tree. My friends say I'm acting wild, the bug I'm in love. I'm all shook up. Mm -hmm. You hosted a chat show once, didn't you, many moons ago? Yes, I did, yes. I was wondering if you got any public reaction to it at all. Yes, the, the public reaction was that I should desist <laughs> from hosting a chat show. Um, one of the main problems I found as an interviewer was an inability to hear what the other person was saying. <laughs> and if I did, no interest in it whatsoever either. But this extract of him phoning a viewer live, who had complained about the show, suggests that it was simply years ahead of its time, with Peter's anarchic approach being far too dangerous and edgy for the BBC in the early 1970s. You were watching last week, weren't you? Yeah. And you disliked it very much? Yeah, I thought you were a colossal bore. Yeah. <laughs> You probably are yourself? Yeah. Oh, definitely. It's nice to talk to you. Somebody in a letter to me the other week said I was pissed. You sound a bit gone yourself. Yeah. All right. <laughs> OK, bye-bye. Nice to talk to you. Yeah, nice to talk to you. What a hypocrite. <laughs> nice to talk to me? Why do you say it's nice to talk to me? It hates me. Two weeks after it began, Peter's groundbreaking and anarchic show was unceremoniously axed and was replaced in the schedules by... <laughs> Some say that Peter Cook's greatest creation is E.L. Whisty. Some say it was Pete and Dud. But for a generation of comedy writers and performers, Derek and Clive was the equivalent of punk rock. Iconoclastic, deliberately offensive, and very funny. For those of you who are offended by very, very bad language, you may wish to press the mute button or leave the house for the next couple of minutes or sing a loud and improving hymn.
I wrote to whatever the fucking name is, the head of the fucking BBC. Dear Cunt. Yeah, that's what I said. That's it, yeah. I put Cunt London on. Yeah, Cunt London. Cunt TV Centre. No, not even TV Centre. You don't have to put TV Centre. Cunt London. It reaches the Director General of the BBC. You can be certain of that. Yeah. So I said, Dear Cunt, your fucking crew came round my fucking place last night and tried to film me fucking masturbating. And I did it perfectly well the first take. And they said they got a fucking air in the gate. And I'm paying 25 quid a fucking fucking year to have a fucking colour licence and this is the fucking service I get and I said if we have any more Joyce Grenfell repeats I'll right. come round to the TV centre beat you to death with the fucking you, horn beat you to death yeah, with my yeah, horn yeah get my fucking horn out and beat the old fucking TV centre and down what reply I'll did, fucking what, raise it what with my what reply did I get dear sir we thank you for your inquiry and we regret Cut. to say Look. that we are unable to bring it into BBC 2 planning this coming year, but we'll bear it in mind. You see, you so I sent round, bear it in mind, get the sarcasm yeah, of that. The subtle sarcasm yeah, of it, bear, bear it in mind. Bear it up your ass, mate. One of the boxes we discovered contained another cassette of a home recording made by Peter, seemingly post Pete and Dud, and more like a prototype version of Derek and Clive, cranking up the bad language and markedly far beyond what was acceptable by British broadcasters in the early 70s. And even today, it's still pretty close to the bone. Well, anyway... Have you got anything in the pipeline as regards a job at all? Well, as I said, I've been down the Labour Exchange, there's nothing much good going. I've had one offer. Yeah, what's that? One fucking offer. Eating shit. Uh, how does that appeal to you? Well, you know, I think uh, you had a pinch, I'll take it. I yeah, mean, yeah. At least it's regular. Yeah, yeah, you're right there. <laughs> After years of Pete and Dud being acceptable family entertainment, they finally broke free of those restrictions, revelling in their own transgressions. Here is a never-released extract from Derek and Clive. Oh, I had a terrible time during the war, you know. Hold on. <sighs> right, then. <laughs> oh, yeah. I had a, I had a dreadful time uh, during the war, you know. Yeah? Yeah, I was in... Uh, I was in espionage. Espionage? No, espionage. Oh, espionage. Uh, I was a, I was a undercover agent for the for the British government. Oh yeah. And uh, I had to infiltrate behind the German lines <coughs> and uh, get into Hitler's household. Yeah, oh yeah. I had to get into his arsehole, That was worse. No, did. Yeah. No, because uh, that is amazing. I never met you because uh, my job was to pose as. Uh, his toothbrush, you see. Oh, really? Oh, I was Hitler's toothbrush. You were Hitler's toothbrush? Yes, throughout the war, you know, every morning, every night. Uh, I used to be put inside his mouth and I sort of spied Well, around. I suppose this, this gave After rise, these yeah. were filmed and the records released, the Home Secretary himself received calls for the pair to be prosecuted for obscenity. The mighty combination of the West Yorkshire and Wolverhampton scene publication police squads called for Peter and Dudley to be arrested. Oh, and the BBC Bandit too. Oh, and so did Mary Whitehouse, in her own sweet way. Not too long after the dust had settled over Derek and Clive, Peter met the woman who would be his wife for the rest of his life. Lynn told us about her own background before she met Peter. My dad was a professional gambler. Is that a good start? It's a good start. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Better than most of you are, I never met one of them. <laughs> I'd love to tell the story of how I met. I happened to be a guest one weekend at the country house stocks in Tring. At stocks, there's a games room, and late one evening, I was playing the backgammon with one of the other guests when Peter stumbled in, very drunk, and came straight to where I was playing backgammon, moved the pieces about, asking at the same time who's winning. <laughs> I bought my first home in Hampstead in the 70s, about four years before I met Peter. I'm quite proud to say that that was my home, in fact. Nobody can think that I was after Peter for his money. And Peter was walking right past at the entrance with an armful of books. This time, he talked to me as though I was an old friend. He invited me to see his house, which, which was close to mine. And when I went in, I had such a shock. I've never seen a house like his. It was 
unbelievable. I went, oh, a terrible mess. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I had such a shock because the kitchen sink was full, the sideboards were all covered with things. You could not get into the uh, utility room. And upstairs, there were plates on the floor, the books were all this way and that way. And uh, show, when he showed me the upstairs, the cupboard doors were open, the drawers were pulled out, there were clothes on the floor. And I just said to him, you know, if a burglar broke in, he would think your house has already been done. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if he wanted a snack, he just opened a can of baked beans with mash that he made, instant mash. It tasted good. I, I'm eating that now. My daughter loves it too. Our, gra our friendship gradually developed into a relationship and uh, some years later led to us getting married. I never asked him to divorce his wife. It was, although I left him several times and it was his choice when he decided that he loved me enough and cared for me enough to want to be married. We always kept our own houses. Sometimes we lived at Peter's house, sometimes in mine, and that seemed to work for us because we were friends for a year and a half before we were a relationship. Previous biographies of Peter have characterized him as a tortured genius, and the latter part of his life as a massive decline. It's a cliché we all like to hear about comedians, but the reality is, of course, more nuanced. True, Peter was sometimes a distant and selfish drunk. And out of the blue I asked him, why do you drink so much? And his answer was the last thing I expected. He just said despair, really. But what's not known is that he had long periods off the booze, once up to seven months, and he attended the local AA in Hampstead. During these bouts of sobriety, he showed Lynn his tender and romantic side, as clearly demonstrated by these handwritten notes, which he regularly left for her. He was very romantic and tender, yes. different from the cynical and shocking person. He used to leave notes for me all around the house, like these ones. He drew a picture with a bubble, I love you and then below it, still courting you after all these years. Husband who feels so much better when you're home. Your loving husband, and then lots of crosses. Mm -hmm. Darling, I love you so much. Sorry, I'm so miserable. And the other one, which also means a lot to me, was when you smile, my heart leaps. Please don't ever leave me, I couldn't bear it. Now he's left me. I'm finding it hard to bear as well. And for a seemingly cynical man, he was capable of making grand romantic gestures. I was woken up by a call from Peter asking me to look out of the hotel room. And uh, to my amazement when I opened the window and looked out, he had scribbled, PC loves Elsie, in huge letters on the sand. Huge letters on the sand. Couldn't believe my eyes. Unimaginable that Peter could do such a thing. And of course, the rest of the day, all I had were comments from the wives about how romantic Peter was. And, we, and nearly all the women were saying they wished their husband was like that. Boldly expressing love for the wife in large letters on the sand. John Cleese was one of Peter's closest friends. Probably, John was probably the friend who loved Peter the most out of all of Peter's friends, including Dudley. And um, at one year, John invited a group of people to his house and uh, surprised everybody by saying that he was inviting 40 friends to join him on a trip down the Nile. <laughs> This trip was called by John Cleese, the fish called Wanda roiled his party cruise. A 15-day journey down the Nile on the Royal Rhapsody, given, amazingly generously, all expenses paid by Cleese to 40 of his closest friends. 
many from the world of comedy, including, as seen here, a 32-year-old Stephen Fry, who somewhat typically chose Billy Bunter on the Nile, which he read in daily instalments. Billy Bunter turned his big spectacles on the gesticulating Mustafa with an alarmed blink. Interspersed with a Nile-inspired fashion show, this is Peter as the Invisible Sphinx. <laughs> followed by a mock BBC interview that could never have made it to PM. Excuse me, could I just have a few words for the benefit? We're from the BBC and we just wanted to go. Miss <laughs> yes, Garbo is not available for comment at the moment. Would, could you just outline the events leading up to the present situation? Traumatic rape in the Ramada Inn in Detroit. <laughs> Further Billy Bunter readings by Stephen Fry. Building, knocking, teeth, my feet and teeth with a stick. Yes. Some no nonsense belly dancing, or in this case, beer belly dancing. During the trip, Peter invented a new ball game, which he took very seriously. No! Um, the game is, is a, a game of skill, uh, strength, cunning, uh, not, not the same. It is a question of placing the balls, las balones or los bolocos. Los bolocos have to go and fly between the aluminium hoops. Should they traverse the aluminium hoops successfully without touching the centre hoops, three points to score. This is known as a strike. This is known as a nothing. <laughs> I'm also known as a nothing, hence the being an NBC sportscaster. This broadcast has been brought to you by the Pepsi and Pepsi Cola Company in association with the Dallas <laughs> Memorial Fund. And a championship between the waiting staff and the celebrity guests. Yes, 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 yes! No! More Billy Bunter readings by Stephen Fry. Hassan gave a cough. <clears throat> Later, Peter found time to have some fun and games with a loaded gun belonging to a security guard. This, of course, was back in the day when you could still joke about such things. Is it loaded? Yes, it is loaded. And for a bribe, Peter persuaded the security guard to attempt a half-hearted arrest on an unruffled John Cleese. And in many ways, Earlier, we heard an interviewer claiming that Peter had an obsession with nuns. About this because in many of your TV sketches, heaven and, in fact, nuns seem to feature pretty prominently. What is we were unsure if that were true, but swayed when we explored the house. From the garden can be seen the quasi-ecclesiastical windows. And when we went up to the rooftop, we discovered that his house directly overlooks a convent. Looking through the archive, it's clear that Peter missed no opportunity to stick Dudley into a wimple and a habit, and himself come to that. or 15th century. It had its origins there, you know, when St. Beryl, who was the daughter of St. Vitus, the well-known dancer... <laughs> I'm not aware that he's obsessed with men. So how can you ask me that question? Way, I don't know. <laughs> Be that they inspired him. I don't know, but it's not me to say. Do you leap at all yourself, madam? Well, I love to leap, and indeed, who doesn't? <laughs> when was that sketch done? He moved here in about 1970. So that was before he moved here. Yeah, yeah but he may have moved here because he was obsessed oh. by nuns. <laughs> <laughs> Peter was obsessed by sport throughout his life. He later codified the rules for that Nile trip ball game he invented, which he called Los Bolocos, into a very formal, detailed document. And on days when he didn't feel like walking to the golf course, he invented his own version, which he played outside his own front door, roping in bemused neighbors, friends, and passers-by, and making use of any items in the street that came to hand. Once again, our mystery camera operator, possibly a neighbour, seemingly suffering from many years' disease, was instructed to capture the vital moments of this impromptu tournament. This is the par three, 18th of Pan's Walk. 
Wind left to right and right to left. <laughs> <laughs> I told you a two pattern. <laughs> He's mad. <laughs> oh, go. No. Wow. <laughs> Peter's early brilliance and youthful good looks entranced even the most famous woman in the world in that fateful year of 1963. A note from Jackie Kennedy to Adlai Stevenson has been discovered thanking him for her Beyond the Fringe tickets. In it, she praises the show, saying that it ran the gamut, comedy, drama, and for me, abandoned delight, the gayest, happiest evening imaginable. The story wasn't known at the time, but Jackie Kennedy allegedly joined a long list of Peter's lovers during his 20s. When we weren't filming Lynn, but running an audio recording, we asked her if she could confirm whether Peter had had the rumoured affair. Our question reduced Lynn to an uncharacteristic whisper. How do I tackle that? I don't know. I know they met when Peter was performing in New York with Dudley. At one time when I went to listen to Alan Bennett at the South Bank, I was amazed, as probably was the rest of the audience, when Alan said he was sure there was something between Jackie Kennedy and Peter because he saw Jackie tenderly stroking Peter's hand at some event or other. And I remember being told that the president had wanted them to go to the White House to perform. Uh, the agent and the other three were very excited and happy and went and told Peter that the president wants us to go to the White House. To their dismay, what Peter said was, I'm not an effing Cabri, and he refused to go. So the president had to go to the theater to see the show like everybody else. Apart from that, Mrs. President, how did you enjoy the show? Throughout the decades, Peter's house was a regular drop-in for a wide range of celebrities, including the occasional Rolling Stone. I know he was close to the Stones. I mean, he was particularly Ronnie Wood and uh, Keith Richards. And I think they were very fond of him too because I remember Keith telling me that when they were un fed up or unhappy on tour, they would always play Derek and Clive. We're doing reactions now, very close. Nigeria. Isn't that good? Some of it's very accurate, actually. No, I never knew that river. Bizarrely, the Stones were particularly interested in cartography, in particular, Peter's map of Nigeria, that's still on the wall to this day. Use of my freeze frame button even reveals Ian Dury, who was a huge Peter Cook fan. Send in the next auditioner, would you? As this program is called The Undiscovered Peter Cook, we were reluctant to show Peter's most famous sketch, written when he was still a student, about a one legged man auditioning for Tarzan. But here it is, though, as you've never seen it before. Peter Cook is Dudley Moore, Elusir, Ezer Kilenzas Hotvamban, as Edinburgh Festival on a Beyond the Fringe. Again, you look. As you can see from this tape, sent to Peter by a producer from Hungarian television, the actor, wearing a wooden leg, seemingly taken from a table, has missed the entire point of the sketch. So sadly, the famous line, I've nothing against your right leg, unfortunately, neither have you, makes no sense whatsoever. But with typical generosity, Peter encouraged his Hungarian protégés and was personally presented with a video of the show autographed by the entire cast. And he even took the producer out for lunch in London. The comedian and satirist Peter Cook has died in hospital. He was 57. Peter died early in the morning, and when I left the hospital, the whole world seemed very strange. I got a cab and I came home, pulled all the blinds down at his house, and went back to my own home. I was in such a state of shock. 
I probably was like a zombie. You know, after Peter died, I just did not know what to do, how to arrange a funeral or, or, or me memorial services or anything. A few months after his death, Lynn Cook arranged a memorial service for Peter at his local church in Hampstead. The BBC suggested a somewhat grander venue. I did speak to the person, I forget his name, at the BBC who told me Peter could have the memorial service at Westminster Abbey. And I said, no, 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 because that won't be Peter, because Hampstead was like his beloved territories. So it was that on May the 1st, 1995, mostly everyone involved in British comedy at the time turned up to show their respects. And seemingly everyone from British sport too. Oh, and Dave Allen. Lynn insisted that only her stills photographer could cover the events from inside the church. But, thankfully for us, the photographer failed to follow orders. And so it is that we have a somewhat nervously shot video of the memorial. To my dismay, an annoyance, they later told me that they had also made a video of the guests. So for years I've kept both the recording and the video put away somewhere in the house. And this, this video has never been seen uh, ever. I don't think I've ever seen it myself too. There were moving tributes from Eleanor Bron, Richard Ingrams, John Cleese, and of course, Dudley. Dudley was of course a central figure. and He told some very funny stories about Peter. I met my wife during the war. She blew in through the window on a piece of shrapnel and we came. <laughs> he came buried in the sofa. <laughs> One thing led to my mother. <laughs> and we were married within the hour. <laughs> I laughed for a week when he spontaneously came out with that. Uh, Peter Cook was tone deaf. <laughs> he didn't display an overt sympathy for things musical except for Elvis Presley, whom uh, Alan mentioned, um, whom he would imitate at the top of a hat. I therefore agonised over what to play until the mists were cleared by one of my confreres who, during the phone call, mentioned a track that I had recorded. It seems as appropriate as anything since the title comes from one of Peter's concepts, that of a blind man reading on TV from Braille. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, one of his favourite utterances. I am blonde. <laughs> and I'm reading to you through the miracle of Broil. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'll feel that again. <laughs> Three blonde nights. Dudley didn't yet know it, but he was already in the early stages of the progressive supranuclear palsy that would eventually kill him. might be the last photograph that was ever taken of Peter and Dudley together. I, I took it. So much that's in the press is wrong. People make assumptions about Peter, about me, and Dudley too, of course, where they do not know us at all. And it's totally untrue that Peter didn't get on. They were good friends. They, they always had a special friendship. So they were close towards the end, and we often met up. He was always in touch with Peter. Even Peter's memorial service was not free from religious controversy. Lynn wanted a choir from Radley to sing Peter's favourite Elvis Presley hit, Love Me Tender. But the vicar was having none of it. I went to see the local vicar. After I found out about how a memorial service should be and, and what's what and seen a couple of 
order of service, I then had some idea. So, off I went to the vicar and said, I would like the Radley Boys Choir to sing at Peter's memorial service. And uh, it's an Elvis song, Love Me Tender. Vicar said, no, 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 couldn't have that. And it has to be the church choir. To which I promptly said, well, if I can't have that, I'll have to hold a memorial service elsewhere because I've set my heart on that. And the result? Lynn Cook won the Church of England nil. So he then agreed. And the boy sang it so beautifully. After the service, one of Peter's oldest friends, David Frost, explained how important Lynn had been to Peter's life and further confirmed that there was never any enmity between the two men. Who, who are we talking for? This is for Lynn. This is for Lynn? Yeah. Lynn, that was a wonderful service you organised. You were so wonderful for Peter. And we were celebrating today, weren't we, as well as grieving celebrating it. Like people talk about his life's work about people and but in Peter's case his life work and his life's play too because of that laughter he brought to us all. And he was the first time in my life that I was conscious of meeting a genius that was up at Cambridge and he stayed that way of course he did once you're a genius always a genius. So original we'll miss his originality and uh, you'll miss so much more of course but but join us in the celebration as well, if you can, because all the people here today love him. And they love you, and they love what you did for him. Now, uh, one other thing, David, could uh, a last word to Peter, you know, just, yeah. a last thing you would say to Peter? And that's looking at me. What would be my last word to Peter? Well, I guess... Thank you for saving me from drowning. Why you saying that? It's, well, it was part of the service today, and it really did happen. And, of course, you're grateful. Grateful to him for a lot else, too. And Dame Edna turned up in drag. <coughs> uh, I've got lots of memories of Peter. Uh, he was such a help to me in my early days. And, uh, Though I saw little of him in the last years, we always met as old friends. Um, and uh, his, uh, it's quite impossible for me to think of him as dead because he's a, a perpetual spirit. I don't think I do not think anyone can understand what made Peter the comedy genius that he was. For me, he was someone special who I got to understand and love. He turned my life upside down when he came into it. Shattered it when he left. I still miss his energy, his warmth, his company, and his love. Baby, baby, you, baby, you.